making our way through the book of Genesis, and we've sort of taken a, a stop to dig deep into the life of Abraham. Now, the truth be told, we could be on Abraham all summer long if we chose to. But we're going to take three weeks. The first week was last week, talking about the incredible promise that God made to Abraham, that, that because he trusted God, it was counted to him as righteousness, and that his descendants would be counted, numbered like the stars in the sky. Next weekend, we're going to talk about that incredible episode that involves Isaac and, and Abraham and that amazing trust. This weekend, we're, we're paused at one of those stories that's a really interesting, intricate, tough story. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, when you think of Sodom and Gomorrah, what do you think of? I heard at least one person say it's sin, right? Yeah, Sodom and Gomorrah is famous because it was destroyed because of wickedness, because of sin. And when we think about that, we've got a, we've got a city in our own country that's called Sin City, right? Las Vegas. How many have been to Las Vegas? So here's the, the really interesting question. We have this tendency in our, in our world, in our culture, to think in a very binary way, right? And by binary, I mean it's either off or it's on. One way or the other. So if we think about something like, uh, like Las Vegas, it's either good or it's bad. If we think about people or situations or things or politics, it's either good or bad. We're for it or against it. And it's really tough. We don't take the time. We don't expend the intellectual energy to think about the gray parts of things. It's easier just to be one or the other. So truth be told, is Las Vegas all bad or is it not? Well, it's not, of course. I mean, the fact of the matter is, despite its name, Sin City, I know of at least two great Christian churches, cutting-edge Christian ministries in Las Vegas. I know of an amazing school, Christian, Lutheran school in Las Vegas. I mean, even if we, we step outside of that realm, I mean, it has all kinds of great food, some of the best entertainment in the world. There are amazing sights both in the city and outside of the city. I mean, the fact of the matter is there's no way, even though it's called Sin City, you can't label Las Vegas and say it's all bad. That's the easy road. You know, I, we do this a lot with people. In fact, I think we do it more with people than we do with issues. We either like them or we don't. We love them or we hate them. I mean, we just use that binary switch all the time. I I think about back in college, when I was a freshman in college, I had a professor uh, for Greek. And uh, I was there early and had my, got my class schedule, and we were talking with some of, the, some of the other football players who were upperclassmen about our class schedule. And when they saw mine and they saw this professor's name on my schedule list, they were like, oh, that's bad. He's really tough. He's really demanding. He requires lots and lots of homework. This guy, get him off your schedule if you possibly can. Well, the thing was, in the major that I had, I had to start taking classes with the professor in my freshman year. I would never complete the major. I really had no choice. And so I had all kinds of anxiety thinking about this professor and how horrible it was going to be. When I finally got into the class, I discovered a couple of things. Number one, I discovered he really was tough. And number two, I discovered he really was demanding. But the third thing surprised me, surprised me because I discovered that he was the best teacher I had ever had. He was amazing, and he, and he taught in a way that resonated with me and, and opened up all kinds of possibilities. In fact, not only did I take that one class with him, I took 13 more. Took every class that he offered and every subject that he offered and even did some independent studies with him. He was such a great teacher. But if we just flipped the switch, or frankly, if I'd had the option and listened to that flip that had been switched already, I would have never had that experience. As we think about this this story of Abraham's interaction with God about the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, we've got to move beyond binary thinking. We've got to understand what it is that Abraham is pleading about. So let's dig in. Genesis chapter 18. Verse 23, 
Then Abraham approached the Lord and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? That's pretty bold, isn't it? I mean, Abraham is not just asking God a question. He's, he's making an argument. He's making an appeal. And his appeal is really based on two concepts. Number one, it's the concept that we just talked about, that every cloud has a silver lining. He's saying, hey, listen, it can't be all bad. It can't possibly be completely evil. There have got to be some good people there. But the second argument is also interesting. He's sort of making the appeal that good should be weighted heavier than evil. Now, we don't tend to do that. You and I have a tendency to, to, to allow bad things to overshadow good things. There can be a whole long list of, of things that people say to you that are positive, that are good, that are encouraging, that are uplifting, and along comes one negative comment or one criticism, and it, it breaks our hearts, right? But shouldn't good be weightier than bad, than evil? I mean, think about it. Using bad to outweigh good leads to cynicism and it leads to pain, to despair. Allowing good to outweigh bad leads to hope. So which side do you want to be on? You know, I was thinking about that experience this week, about that whole idea. You know, earlier this week, I told you last weekend, I was headed to Chicago for a meeting. Then I was going to Oklahoma City to catch up with the, the mission team. And I was supposed to get into Oklahoma City at 9.30 in the morning. So I'd have all day on Wednesday and then all day Thursday and fly out Thursday evening. Well, my timing was really bad. Because my time to leave Chicago coincided with a thunderstorm. And it shut down all kinds of flights. My flight was delayed and delayed and delayed and then canceled. Then they, they put me on another flight and it was delayed and delayed and I was certain it was going to be canceled. And I was there with, with thousands of my best friends. I mean, this was O'Hare Airport and it was mobbed. There were people everywhere. There were so many people that the vendors were running out of water in the, in the vending machines. I mean, it was absolutely mobbed with people. And of course, the places that were most mobbed were the, uh, the customer service counters and the, the gates where they were reassigning and finding new flights and all that kind of stuff. And of course, in those places, you could see lots of waving arms and you could hear lots of raised voices because there were a lot of people, thousands of people who were being inconvenienced and some of them were being profoundly inconvenienced. Have you ever been inconvenienced? How do you respond to that? I'm guessing at least sometimes when you are inconvenienced, your response isn't your best moment. Well, I was waiting for this flight that was delayed and delayed and delayed. I finally left at about 10 minutes to 9 in the evening. And uh, I was sitting down. I was feeling kind of grateful because the people who were sitting right next to me found out that they were leaving the next morning at 6 a.m. But as I was sitting there, so I found this open seat in this mob, this sea of people. And it was sort of in that interesting spot. You know how the, the gate is there and there's the counter where the, the agents stand and they work with you. And there's the, the backstop that gives you all the information about flights. And the seat was sort of right there. So I was lined up between the, the desk and the backstop. I could see right there behind where the people are normally standing. But nobody was standing at the desk. But as I kind of sat there and, and was looking around, I realized that there was a gate agent and she was hiding. <laughs> no kidding, she's, she's ducked down, she's sitting on a stool, she's hiding and she's bent over so that nobody can see her above the desk and, and she's just got her head down and she's got her eyes closed and you know she's just praying nobody finds her. <laughs> and she opened her eyes and she looked over at me, I guess she could sense that somebody was looking at her, she looked over at me and she just had this horrified look like, oh my gosh, please don't ask me a question. 
And I said, man, I bet you're having a tough day. She's like, <laughs> And so in one of my more gracious moments, I said, I think you're doing a good job. And this, this lady's face went from just exhausted and frustrated and weary to this big smile. Now, she was still terrified someone would know she was there because instead of saying something to me, she just went. <laughs> but, you know, it was that one moment. Now, again, that, that was a, a, a rare, excellent moment for me. But in that one moment, having something good to say, finding a positive thing made a big difference in an otherwise really lousy day. You and I have the power to do that. We have the, pow the power to bring good to bear in the midst of a sin-darkened world, and it can make a powerful impact. Think about our mission team in Oklahoma City last week. They were serving in a really difficult neighborhood. All kinds of pain, all kinds of poverty, all kinds of neglect, all kinds of abuse, all kinds of struggles. These people are hurting people. But if you ask me to tell you the one thing that I saw more often than not in that place, you said give one word to describe what you saw most often, I would tell you I saw smiles. Smiles on the faces of our team who were working in this hot, brutal circumstance, in this very unpleasant situation, making sacrifices, and smiles on the faces of the people that they were serving. Because good overpowers evil. It has that power. And that's exactly what Abraham is saying to God. He's saying it can't be all bad. And, and even if it is all bad, if there are a few, if there are just a few good people, they can overwhelm the evil if you just give them time. Well, God responds. He says, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. So Abraham presses a little further. Now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five people? He's, he's doing his best, isn't he? And lo and behold, what happens is God continues to agree with him and Abraham goes from 50 to 45 to 40 to 30 to 20. If there are only 10 people, God finally agrees. He will not destroy the city because of them. Problem is, there aren't. God goes into the city and it is a horrible circumstance. In fact, if you, uh, if you read this story in Genesis 18 and 19 later on today, you, you get a, a clear sense. There's a sense of, of oppression and darkness and wickedness that, that you can feel just by reading the pages. And so God sends destruction. It says, the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. You know, there are those who speculate that, that literally God used a volcano to wipe out those cities. And I was thinking about that. The closest, you know, that we have to that kind of a thing is Mount St. Helens back in May of 1980, Right? And you remember the, the amazing destruction? Just a, just a quick glimpse. I mean, here's a before and after picture. One side, we've got this huge mountain, and, then, and after, we've got a huge crater. I mean, imagine that power. It absolutely devastated those cities. But the thing is, it's not, it's not what happens in Sodom and Gomorrah that I want to focus on. What I want to focus on for the next few moments is why did Abraham try so hard? Why did he go through this long litany, this long argument? Why did he plead with God for the sake of Sodom and Gomorrah? I've got three points. Are you ready? Number one, Abraham saw himself 
in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. What I mean by that is God's telling him that the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah have come before me and I'm going to wipe them out. And Abraham's thinking, I've been wicked myself. I'm I'm sinful myself. I mean, as you think about the story of Abraham, we don't have time to cover the whole thing, but the reality is Abraham has made all kinds of mistakes. There are all kinds of points where he's wandered away from God. He's done his own thing. He's broken faith with God. The only reason he's still alive is because God's been faithful to him. But the fact is his sin is plain and it's clear. And when Abraham looks at the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he sees his own wickedness. And it's terrifying. You know, did you learn the same little lesson from your grandparents and parents and Sunday school teachers and everybody else? When you you point at somebody else, accuse, condemn somebody else, you have what? Three fingers pointing back at you, right? The whole idea of that little parable is the idea that that we are all broken and we are all sinful and that when we start condemning other people, we ought to be condemning ourselves. Well, the reality is the Scriptures teach that. In Romans chapter 2, verse 1, it says, You have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same thing. Abraham gets it. Abraham thinks about God going down to destroy the people in Sodom and Gomorrah and he sees himself in that situation and he pleads for them. You know, it reminds me of of when Jesus is teaching in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. And he's talking about judgment and condemnation. And he makes the point that, that murder, murder, the sin of murder isn't just taking another person's life. The sin of murder goes all the way to when we hate someone in our heart. He says, you've already committed murder in your heart. Or sexual immorality. It's not just about a physical act that will occur between two people. That literally when we lust, we've already committed adultery. We've already committed sexual immorality in our heart. That we are guilty by virtue of our thoughts and our attitudes. It's not just the the, the effort of pointing out someone who's done something specific. The reality, dear friends, is that, that we are quick to condemn and quick to judge. But isn't it interesting that Jesus said, the world will know that you are my disciples not because your judgment, not because of your condemnation. The world will know that you are my disciples, my followers, because of your love. Abraham sees himself And recognizes that he is just as broken as the people around him. And that he recognizes that they desperately need mercy. And he pleads for it. Dear brothers and sisters, should we be any different? See, the crazy thing about our God is that he doesn't just love believers. He doesn't just love people who are getting it right. If that were the case, then none of us would have hope. Because we all get it wrong, and we are all broken, and we all make mistakes. See, God hates sin, and he hates the consequences and the devastation that sin wreaks in our lives and in our world, but God loves sinners. Shouldn't we have the eyes and the heart of our God to love broken, sinful people? to pray for them, to intercede for them, to serve them, to share hope with them. That brings us to the, to the second point. Not only does Abraham see himself in the circumstance, Abraham saw God's heart. He understood God's heart. Because God doesn't want to, to destroy. God doesn't want to bring devastation. In fact, there's an is- interesting point. You, you will miss this if you don't read carefully. But in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, in Genesis 18, verse 20 and 21, it says the outcry, God is speaking, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, 
I will know. Now ask yourself this question. When God says, I'm going to go down, I'm going to check this out, I'm going to see if it's as bad as the outcry that's come up to me, if it's really all that bad, if it's not, I will know. Why doesn't he say, if it is, I'm going to wipe them out? I mean, doesn't that make more sense? I'm going to go down, I'm going to check it out, I'm going to see if it's as bad as it seems from my seat in heaven, and if it is, they're done. But he doesn't say that. So I'm going to go down and check it out, see if it is as bad as the outcry that's come up before me. And if it is not, I will know. You know why God says that? Because he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want to bring destruction. That's alien to God. In fact, there's a a doctrine that has to do with the alien and the proper work of God. And, And to explain that, let me take a step back. You know what I'm talking about if I say law and gospel, right? Very quickly, law is, is, is God's rules. God's is, God, it's what's right and what's wrong. And so the law shows us our mistakes. It gives us sort of guidelines that we, that we walk on, kind of like bumper cars, you know, where we, where we don't go outside of the bounds. And it also gives us a way of understanding how to make things right again. But the reality is that all of us break God's law. That's why the gospel is so important because the gospel is the message that even though we break God's law, even though we never get that perfect, God loves us. In fact, God loves us so much that he sent his son to pay the price for every sin we ever commit. That's the gospel. Well, intimately connected to the idea of law and gospel is this alien and proper work of God. The alien work of God is that work that God must do that he hates doing. It's foreign to him. He he hates it. But it's judgment and condemnation and, and consequences. The work that is proper to God, the work that God loves, is the law of uh, the, the work of love and forgiveness and grace and mercy. In fact, Martin Luther has a great quote in the Heidelberg Disputation. The alien work of God is when he humbles us thoroughly, making us despair, breaking us, so that he may exalt us in his mercy, giving us hope. You see, just like law and gospel work together, God's alien and proper work work together. He doesn't want to judge. He doesn't want to bring despair. But it's only by bringing judgment and despair that he can lift us up and exalt us with his grace and his mercy. Abraham understands this. That God doesn't want to bring destruction. And that's what he's playing on these, in these arguments. So Abraham sees himself in the brokenness and the sin of the city of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham knows that he sees God's heart. That brings us to point number three. Abraham also sees something that he can love. He sees something of value, something that is precious to him in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you remember who lives there? His nephew, Lot, and his family. They live in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Abraham sees that and he's pleading, he's appealing. Because in that city there is someone, something that he can love. You know, that makes me think about the story of Jesus when he encounters the rich young ruler. Do you remember that story? Jesus is going about his teaching and along comes this rich young ruler. And this guy is is pompous and he's full of himself and he's pretty certain that he's got life completely together. He comes to Jesus and he asks what sounds like a humble question. He says, what must I do to be be saved? Or what must I add to these to be saved? And lo and behold, he's expecting that Jesus is going to say to him, dude, you, you by far are the greatest human being I've ever met on the face of the earth. But Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus challenges him. In fact, challenges him at the heart of his, of his ego. And the fact is, he's, he, his countenance drops and he walks away and he's discouraged. And if you and I aren't careful, we'd say, way to go, Jesus. Way to slap that arrogant guy down. Way to, way to mess with his ego. Because you and I would see that and we'd respond to that. We'd be angry about that or we'd be offended by that or we'd be put off. We'd want to see that guy put in his place. 
But there's a, a, a sentence in the midst of that gospel story that we've got to notice. We put it on the screen. Jesus looked at him and what? This arrogant, pompous, self-righteous guy who is in the face of the Lord of heaven and earth thinks that he's got it all together and he comes to Jesus to be told he's the greatest human being that's ever lived and Jesus looks at him and in him he sees someone to love. And when he challenges him and when he breaks his heart, he's not breaking his heart because he wants to slap him down. He breaks his heart because he has to shatter the illusion of the lie that he's living for him to have any hope. See, the reality is that our God loves at all times. Even when you and I are cheering him on because we think he's, he's showing vengeance, we think he's acting and has an attitude like ours, the reality is our God loves. And the beautiful thing is that Abraham looking at this broken, devastatingly sinful place, has compassion. He sees something he can love. You know, I told you about the mission trip. By the way, we'll, we'll have on, on August 13th, during the 9.30 and 11 o'clock hour, the, the, the mission trip folks from the various trips this summer will all have a chance to share what's happened and the experiences they've had. But, you know, the, the crazy thing is that, that our, our kids went to Oklahoma City and it was blazing hot and it was sacrificial circumstances. And yet they come away from that experience. In fact, I've had at least three kids tell me it was the best week of their entire life already. But as I said to you before, the thing that stands out in my mind is the amazing smiles. But the picture that, that I will probably carry with me for years was a, a situation where on a, on a break time, one of our young high school students was sitting in a rocking chair and she had a, a little boy, just a baby, on her lap. And this little baby was dirty and messy. This little baby had been crying. His face was streaked with tears, but he was peaceful. His head was on her shoulder, and she was beaming ear to ear. She had her arms around this messy, smelly, dirty, loud little baby. And she was loving him. You know, when I think about our mission trips, you understand our mission trips are not about going places. Our mission trips, in my mind, are about our congregation through a, a handful of people who are able to go to particular places, but it's about our whole congregation wrapping our arms around broken people, sinful people, hurting people, Messy people. Wrapping our arms around them and loving them with the love of our God. That's what Abraham gets. For all of his faults and all of his flaws, Abraham not only understands the heart of God, Abraham has the heart of God. And he cares about the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, there's one more thing that doesn't have to do with Abraham and what he sees. One more thing, frankly, that Abraham couldn't possibly see. Do you remember last week, at the end of the message, I, I mentioned to you that the cool thing about God's promise to Abraham, remember the promise that, that, he, that Abraham trusted God, it was counted to him as righteousness, and that his descendants, his family, will become a great nation, numbered like the stars in the sky. And I said, the cool thing is you and I can test that promise. We can evaluate that promise from where we sit right now. Because the descendants of Abraham are not just the Jews and the people of Israel through history. The descendants of Abraham and the, the people who are part of his family, those people are all who believe. Remember we went to First Corinthians, or pardon me, to Galatians chapter 3. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. 
Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. That everyone from the time of Abraham until the Lord returns, every person who believes, who puts their trust in Jesus, believes God's promises. Every single one of them, including you and me, we are children of Abraham. Was God faithful to his promise to Abraham? Yeah, phenomenally faithful to his promise. So all of a sudden, think about what's happening here. You know how sin works in our world. It works in our lives. It works in our communities. Sin is contagious. It infected Adam and Eve, and it's infected every one of their descendants. But, but in communities, it, it's even worse. It, it becomes toxic. It flows among people. It begins to, to take over. In fact, in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, remember cities of thousands of people, there were not ten righteous people. That sin had consumed those cities. And Abraham lives right in the midst of those cities. How long do you think it would have taken before Abraham and his family would have been consumed with the toxin of that sin? And God's promises would have been made useless. Have you ever had to do something really, really hard? Brutally hard. And something that's so hard it keeps you up at night. Sometimes you know that it's going to make somebody mad at you. You know that it's going to ruin a relationship. You know that there are going to be consequences. You know that it's going to ruin your reputation. But it's something that has to be done. It's something right, and it has to be done. Have you ever had one of those situations? And have you ever been tempted to say, you know what? I'm out. Too hard, too scary, too, too demanding, too whatever. You ever just bailed on one of those really hard decisions? Isn't it nice to know that even when it requires God to do something that's completely alien to him, he never compromises on his promises. Your hope and my hope, dear friends, it depends on a God who is absolutely faithful. It depends on a God who keeps his promises no matter what. And for all of the, the pain and destruction in the story of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, the truth that remains is that God was faithful to Abraham and he kept his promise even when it was painful. There's a verse that I want us to read together from Lamentations chapter 3. We read with me starting verse 22. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. To love that God's mercy is so great, we are not consumed. Well, the fact is, you and I are not consumed. Because in our place, Jesus, Jesus was consumed. Jesus took our sin. He paid our price. He suffered our consequences. You and I were spared because God sent Jesus. But that's because God is faithful. His faithfulness is amazing. My prayer is that as you and I go forward, even in hard times, even when we don't understand what God's doing, we will trust that He is faithful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for you. We are grateful for your love. We're grateful for the lessons of Genesis and especially the life of Abraham. And Lord, we pray that you would work miraculously in our hearts, that we would be people of profound good and bright light in the midst of darkness. But above all, Lord, we are grateful for your faithfulness to your promises that we cling to. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life. Amen.